The next presentation will be by uh, Dr. Marco Maradi yep. from uh, Research Center San Sebastian of yep. Spain. Yeah. Thank you very Please. much uh, for the introduction. And thank to the organ organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, this topic, which is based on uh, single chain uh, nanoparticles and uh, just a proof of principle of incorporation of uh, a drug, which is doxorubicin. I wanted to start with this slide because I think that in these days we had the opportunity to see that uh, perhaps not several, but uh, some uh, anti cancer nanomedicines are already in the market. That probably the best, uh, the best example is, is this one is uh, doxil, which is a doxorubicin uh, uh, containing liposomes. So liposome is containing uh, doxorubicin, and, and another one, perhaps the, the Abraxan, and we saw in these days that we are now in the second and third generation of, of this kind of uh, uh, nanomedicines. Um, and very nice for me was the presentation about acarines that we had in, in, in the last sessions. Uh, in this case, these are polymeric nanoparticles, and they are in, in clinical trials. Um, and we see that in here, they, uh, I think it's, it's a very versatile uh, strategy that they use in which the polymer is uh, conjugated to, to PEG, and the PEG give, uh, or try to give uh, the avoidance of, of immune system. And uh, this nanoparticle can be functionalized with also with targeted uh, agents. In our case, uh, we work with polymers, but the, the technique is completely different. So uh, what we want to do is to use um, a single chain, a single uh, a unique uh, a polymer chain and to collapse into a, a single a nanoparticle entity. So for this reason, we call single chain nanoparticle. Uh, to do this, there are in the literature many methods. There are not several groups working on this. It's quite probably new uh, technology. Uh, but the intrachain uh, coupling can be, can be made by homocoupling or heterocoupling, depending on the um, functional groups that you have on the, on the single uh, uh, polymer chain. Or what I will present here, you can use a cross-linker. So if you have here functionalities which are complementary to, what, to the ones that you have in your polymer, you can collapse the, the nanoparticle. Which are the drawbacks? Of course, to have a single chain nanoparticle, you have to work, or usually you have to work in, uh, in ultraviolet conditions. Uh, why? To avoid the intercross-linking. So you want a single chain nanoparticle to interact with itself and not to interact with other chains. Otherwise, you do create a micro or, or nano micro gels. So you, you, you uh, couple more than one chain uh, to another. And this is a big problem because uh, when you work in ultraviolet uh, conditions, then you have difficulties to scale up the, the process. And so you don't have uh, the traslability to, uh, to clinic or to the market. Uh, other problems is that usually these uh, uh, kind of uh, nanoparticles are made in uh, organic solvents. You, you, they use methyl catalyst and high temperatures. On the other side, the advantages is that you can choose a lot of precursor, especially if you work with uh, polymer synthesis, like RAFT. Uh, we also work with this. I will present polysaccharide, but uh, you can control very well size and uh, going from 200 nanometers up to 10 or 5 nanometers. You can find, uh, you can put different kind of functionalization. Uh, the idea in general, which is a, like a vision of, of people working with this kind of nanoparticle, is to mimic what nature makes with protein, so to have uh, a folding uh, reversible process. But this is far away from what uh, we are now. Uh, in my case, uh, I will present you the choice of this uh, um, uh, polysaccharide, which is Dextran 40. And the choice has been made because, uh, of course, uh, you know better than me that this is a a glucose-based uh, polymer, so it's an uh, uh, alpha-1,6 uh, uh, polymer. Uh, it is also branched usually in here, in alpha-1,3 uh, alpha, um, uh, position. But the good thing is it's uh, uh, very soluble in water. It's biocompatible, biodegradable. You can have it. Uh, it's commercially available. It's cheap and so on. And uh, especially, we can functionalize almost selectivity at, at this position, in position 3. So this is just to have an idea of the dimension uh, in, of, of this kind of uh, polysaccharide uh, for dextran-40. There are a lot, uh, a range of, of other uh, molecular weight uh, dextrans, but we, are starting, we started using this, uh, this uh, uh, polysaccharide. So uh, what we, our protocol is this, uh, is based on functionalization in disposition of dextran uh, polysaccharide with a metacrylate group. 
Uh, and what we want to do, this is soluble in water, so we want to use this uh, linear, pre this precursor in water in uh, such a way that we don't have in uh, high diluted mm, conditions. So we use 10 to minus 1, 10 to minus 2 molar, which is quite strange for this kind of synthesis, and we made a continuous addition of a linker, which as you can see here is a dithyl linker, so we make like a sort of Michael addition to the double bond, and uh, the continuous addition allows us to have the linker here temporarily in a dilute condition, it reacts, and then we follow the reaction in order to avoid the intra shakeholes linking, it just we have the intra-molecular uh, compound. Um, we, uh, of course, isolated this compound because we wanted to characterize it to be sure that we have the single chain nanoparticles, but we can also make in a sort of one batch reaction that is part of functionalization perhaps here, for example with this uh, mercatopropionic acid, uh, in order to have carboxylic group which are then used by us to incorporate biomolecules, drugs or fluorophores and so on. Uh, the nice thing of this uh, reaction, as you can see, is, it, is that it's run completely in water, so you don't use any catalyst, you don't use any uh, high temperatures, it's made at room temperatures, and uh, it's, it's for this is scalable. Usually the purification is made by water dialysis, and you can freeze dye and recover the, the compound. Um, yep. Just a few words about NMR to see the, the reaction. Yep. Uh, well. Uh, so it's very easy to follow the disappearance of these uh, uh, signals which are typical of the double bond here. So uh, while you are functionalizing with the linker, this signal decreases, and especially this methyl is starting to appear here, as you can see, and the other methyl, as you can see, the methyl group is here. And when you finish the functionalization with the mercatopropionic acid, you have the completely disappearance of, of this kind of methyl group and, of course, of the olefin uh, signals. So this was, uh, of course, um, a signal of uh, the reaction was complete, but uh, didn't give us any uh, idea of what uh, uh, was the, the size and the, and the shape of the nanoparticle. And even the transmission electron microscopy was not enough for us, because you can see a nice uh, globular shape there in, in, in the TAM, but uh, um, the, the starting polymer has also similar shape, so we were not satisfied. And so we, re we, we use a sort of size exclusion chromatography, which is called GPC, so gel permeation chromatography, in order to see really if the collapse to, from, from the polymer to the, to the nanoparticle was eff eff efficient, it was, it was real. Um, and if we didn't have any um, inter-cross-linking. So for this reason, you can see here, this is quite good proof that uh, the retention time of the nanoparticle is much longer than uh, the, the polymer. And this indicates are a smaller uh, hydrodynamic volume of, of, the, of the final particle. And this gives an indication that uh, the, apparent the apparent molecular weight is lower, and this is because we have this shrinking to the nanoparticle. And this, more or less, you see the, the, the zeta average. Of course, the polydispersity is not low, but because also in the, in the uh, polymer that we use, uh, the polydispersity is, is high, because it's a branched polysaccharide. Then, uh, we made some cytotoxicity tests. This is not so interesting for us. I think it was expected that uh, this kind of nanoparticle were not cytotoxic. We tried uh, uh, some uh, different cell lines, and we also make, in collaboration with the fraunhofer Hitem, uh, some uh, gene mutation tests, and they, they didn't show any uh, mutagenic potential. Um, at, at the end, what we did is uh, to try to uh, functionalize the, the nanoparticle with the, the drug doxorubicin. At the beginning, the idea was to uh, incorporate the drug during the process of formation of the nanoparticle, because we have the linker, which is amphiphilic, and the, and the double bond that could host the, nanoparticle, the, the drug. The problem is that uh, the pH that we were working, we saw that there was not reproducibility, probably also because this kind of nanoparticle are not so big, so you can perhaps increase the you can choose other type of dextrans to have a bigger nanoparticle that they can host inside. And so I decided to, to, to make a covalent type conjugation. Uh, I fear a little about the functionality of the drug, but indeed the, the, the moiety that we use is this uh, uh, amino group here. So we usually know that doxorubicin is active and intercalated the, the DNA by this uh, antrachinone ring. And so we make the, the coupling and we try to, to see uh, the, if uh, the, okay, the coupling was successful, more or less we have 5% weight of uh, uh, the, the drug uh, entrapped, um, conjugated to the, to the nanoparticle. 
And uh, what we did at the beginning was the cytotoxicity test. So as you can see here, the nanoparticles alone are not cytotoxic to the cells at the condition that you can see here. And uh, on the other side, when you have uh, the comparison at this concentration of doxorubicin free, which is the black spot, and, the, and, and uh, conjugated to the nanoparticle, we have the similar, similar profile. So it, indeed, the, the cytotoxicity of the nanoparticle is due to the loading of the, of the drug. The only thing is you can see that the doxorubicin, the hydrochloride, uh, the hydrochloride has an EC50, which is uh, twofold, uh, more or less, lower than the one in the, in the nanoparticle. And this can be also expected, but it was for us a little success to have this kind of, uh, of result because the, the drug maintains its functionality. And then we made some tests to, to see the cellular uptake, very preliminary one. What we saw is that the same concentration of uh, uh, doxorubicin the free drug, as chloridrate, I, I insist, is uh, able to, uh, we cannot see so much, but we have the quantification here, it's able to, to go in two hours to directly to the nucleus. Uh, on the other hand, we saw that the nanoparticle uh, also delivered the, the drug, or at least the drug is delivered somehow to the, to the nucleus, but the process is much slower uh, at six hours. In here you can see the quantification after uh, the treatment of the cells and, and the nucleus uh, release an analysis by ultraviolet. And you can see that doxorubicin at uh, two hours is already high levels of, uh, the, the nanograms are quite a lot, and then increases slowly uh, to the six hours. And on the, on the contrary, the nanoparticles are more slowly. The, so it seems that the kinetics is, is slower. So uh, to, to conclude, yeah, uh, what uh, I wanted to present uh, briefly was that we have a technology to, pre to, to prepare biocompatible uh, single chain nanoparticles, which are based on a natural polysaccharide. And we made this kind of reaction by uh, intramolecular reticulation of a single polysaccharide chain uh, by using a, a homobiofunctional cross linker, in this case with the dithiol terminal groups. And the, the procedure is general. I mean, you can use other type of linkers as, as we do. Uh, the further reaction with this uh, uh, mercaptoprionic acid uh, allow us to uh, incorporate uh, carboxylic acid groups, and by this way, we could incorporate the doxorubicin. We saw that the toxicity of the doxorubicin is maintained in vitro, in spite of the covalent bonding. And what we are doing now, which I think for me is quite important, is trying to make a, do a double labeling, because uh, we are not sure if the nucleus is targeted by the dextran with the, with the doxorubicin, or if it's released somehow in the site, in the, in, inside the cells, the, 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 if, if the, the amidic bond is, is broken and, and the doxorubicin then go alone. Um, other important thing that we would like to do is to see if um, the glucose channels um, have a role uh, in, in terms of uh, uptaking the, the nanoparticle. Uh, and now we are also trying to, to incorporate some uh, targeting moieties depending on the tumors that we are want, that we want to, to target. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. And, uh, any questions? Yeah, please. Thank you. Thanks. Interesting stuff. Uh, do you know uh, what was first the number of DOCS residues per one uh, particle of yours? And whether through doxorbicin, which is a fairly sticky molecule, other kind of corona, uh, uh proteins were attached to the surface of the, of it's, the it's a good question. Uh, the, um, I don't have experience with this kind of nanoparticle, but uh, for sure what I know, I worked a lot with gold nanoparticles coated with sugars. And the sugars, as I said at the beginning, perhaps I didn't insist so much, uh, uh, are a sort of peg, peg mimetic. And the advantage I think that the sugars have towards PEG is that they are completely a part of some antigens that you can find in bacteria and the capsular polysaccharide, they are completely silent for, to, the, to the immune system. And the PEG, we have some, some posters there that show that we have some EGG against PEG. So it's the safety in this case, okay, it's approved and so on. So um, about the protein corona, the experience that I have is that uh, unless you want to target some specific lectin, so carbohydrate binding protein that you have in the organism, you don't have this kind of uh, um, attachment. You, um, the only thing is, in any case, I have to, to test with this nanoparticle because when you functionalize with a carboxylic, uh, with a carboxylate, then you have charges. And then in this case, yes, that you can think that uh, probably the sugar is not uh, enough to protect, uh, in this case, it's, it's all the nanoparticles, the sugar itself from uh, the absorption of proteins. And I, and I, I 
plan to make this kind of experiments because they are very important to go to, go to in vivo. We also use this kind, not the polysaccharide based one, but other types of nanoparticle in vivo uh, for targeting purpose. And uh, I have to say that um, they, they reached the tumor in, in quite a good uh, way when they were targeted in respect when they were not targeted. Uh, so, uh, but I, I couldn't say if, if I have protein corona there and which type of proteins can attach to that. Yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah. Please. Hi. Uh, Hi. I was wondering if you were worried about the uh, steric hindrance of the dextrin nanoparticles this, for sorry? the docs, uh, the steric hindrance of the dextrin nanoparticle uh. for the docs orbison to to be able to act properly? And if you have considered any cleavable linkers? Um, in this case, I mean, uh, the steric hindrance, uh, I was a little more scared if I would have put as a, a non-covalent uh, binding to, to the, because it was the initial idea. I, I, I wanted a system which could release the doxorubis in, in non-covalent way, because I, I, it's much better, it's much easier, and it's not, I mean, it is, it's not costless, this kind of conjugation. In this case, uh, it is true that uh, you can think that the uh, alken moieties are like uh, uh, pushing to the to the inside of the nanoparticle. It's probably it's like this. So this can be that they are like hidden, and uh, I think that the carboxylic group are uh, completely exposed to, to the surface. This is also indicated by the zeta potential measurements that we have that they show. So in this case, I. Will say with I will I will put my ma my hand on on fire that the the doxorubicin are completely exposed outside and the advantage is that the the, the entourage the, the dextran is is capable to give what uh, water or aqueous medium solubility yeah thanks for the question okay any other so uh, my yep. question is uh, yep. just to, on the last slide actually you listed all the questions. You raised in our minds, actually, right? <laughs> and you defeated questions. And, and I made it and, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, please, uh, so the, however, uh, please, would you please uh, say a little bit about why this uh, this nanoparticle is taken up by the cells? And, yeah. and, and, and um, though you just said it's ongoing, I think it's uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a mixture of uh, um, so dextran is known. Should, yeah, should dextran is known to enter. Cells, so yeah. it's, it's very known. What I don't know, it, it, it's my my question: if if dextran can go to the nucleus, because there are some contrast uh, articles which are reported, and this is my for this reason I want to make the dual labeling because I want to see if inside the nucleus I have doxorubicin, which has to go there. But and also uh, the difference between uh, the kind of the kinetics, kinetics, I don't know. I think that, of so course, that's uh, impressive. Do, yeah. Yeah, doxorubicin yeah. is the hydrochloride. Uh, the hydrochloride, otherwise, it's not soluble, it doesn't enter. Mm -hmm. uh, dextran is bigger, so uh, you can have the assistance by the receptor, but, but probably you have also more difficulty to make it enter okay. to, to the cell. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, then, uh, now